Hello? Oh, now we're doing good. Now I can hear myself. All right. I think we're good. All right. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. This is Todd back there with the Spokane Plan Commission. This is a, a hearing for September 9th, 2020. Uh, today we will be uh, hearing all of the comprehensive plan amendments. Uh, for 2020. Uh, before we start, uh, could we please ask um, Jackie, could you please take roll call? Okay. Zero, zero. Eight. Okay. Michael Baker. I don't know. I got it. Can you hear me? Hello. Now we can. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Michael Baker. Here. Todd Byrother. Here. John Dietzman. Thank you, John. Uh, Greg Francis. Here. Diana Painter. Here. Carol Shook. And I know Carol was here. I see her. I can see her, but yeah, we haven't heard her yet. All right, one oh, moment. there she goes. Carol, are you here? Can't hear you. Okay. All right, we'll come back to her. Uh, Sylvia St. Clair? Here. Thank you. Joanne Wright? Here. Tom Sanderson? Here. Clifford Winger? Okay, I see Cliff as well. I know he's here. Uh, Mary Winkus? Here. Thank you. And Council Member Mum? She wasn't going to participate. Okay. So we have a quorum. It's my attendee number. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I didn't hear. Did, did we acknowledge that Mary has, has joined us? I guess Mary wouldn't count towards quorum, correct? Oh, but correct. We, no. But we're glad to hear Mary. Thank you. I, I, okay. Oh, okay. Hello. This is Joe. Thought, thought I've been here the entire time. No, no, of course. I, I only bring that up as, as a liaison. Okay. You, we, we are glad you are participating and, and you're out. Oh, and you're, okay. Okay, got it. Uh, I just okay. want to acknowledge that you're here, but but are not um, as late as I'm not a voting member. But thank you. We have uh, three people here. I, I'm sorry. Was that? I, I don't. I'm not uh, aware who that is. Is that someone from the public wishing to be recognized? I think it was somebody. Yes, I think okay, it was I'm somebody sorry. from the public. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to you. Thank you for uh, um, for that, though. Okay, um, with the hearing uh, online, uh, it, we'll go through uh, kind of abbreviated uh, hearing procedures that are appropriate for an online hearing. Um, so today, as uh, we will uh, we will hear a, a, a presentation uh, by 
by staff and and and, and then the um, um, submitting. Um, what word am I looking for here? <laughs> applicant, thank you. Applicant is the word you're looking for. Applicant is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. Okay, so um, in the hearing process, um, today we will uh, impose time limits. We, ha we have uh, uh, probably around, probably at three minutes, so we'll keep time uh, for anyone from the public wishing to testify. Uh, if there's a group uh, that would like to pr present, um, we, we, we can uh, entertain that. I, I do not see anyone signed up as a group. So if you're, if you're presenting individually, please um, avoid repetition. Or if you also have submitted uh, written comments, please feel free to acknowledge that that is also part of the public record and you, and, and you don't necessarily need to, um, and please don't uh, re read those word for word. Please summarize and, 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 and those will be submitted into the record. Um, um, uh, each speaker shall follow all instructions from the president so that his or her remarks may be heard, understood, and recorded. All comments to the Planning Commission shall be directed to the secretary to be appropriately entered in the public record. This includes oral, written, and email comments, as mentioned. And then no modes of expression not provided by these rules, including but not limited to demonstrations, banners, so forth. Um, not necessarily applicable here because we have a little more control, but, uh, but we will enforce uh, enforce that order. Um, uh, with this, uh, anyone wishing to speak um, is given the opportunity on the agenda to click on a link and, and sign up. Uh, but we also will entertain uh, on the WebEx feature here either via chat if you'd like to be recognized, please, please, please put your name in there. Or we also give time for anyone on the phone uh, to verbally state that they would like to be put in the queue. Um, Okay, with that, uh, the other thing I'll mention here is that we have, how many, Kevin, approximately six or seven, if I remember correctly? How many applications? We have nine applications. Or, or nine, thank you. <laughs> we, have, we have six private applications and three from the city. Right, okay, thank you. Our goal today is, is over probably two hours to um, go through each one individually. So that means there will be a presentation for each one. We will... Um, uh, then hear public testimony, and then and then by our, per our rules, the applicant is given an opportunity for a, a rebuttal for any any of the comments that were given. Um, then we will close the verbal testimony most likely today, um, and and likely keep written testimony open. Uh, I, th I think we're going to set that at seven at seven days, and then uh, most likely then we will. That will keep the, the written record open for seven days. We will close that at that date given, and then in 14 days on September 23rd, we will likely then close all. Uh, we will then um, deliberate as a as a commission and, and take and take action. Okay, I think that's enough. With that, um, are there any questions? I think we can probably move into our our first. Um, our first am amendment. So I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Kevin Freebot. Thank you, Planning Commission President, Planning Commissioners. Uh, give me just a moment here to get set up and away we'll go. My apologies, there's about 18 things I have to do here before I can actually start. Great. Well, thank you again, uh, Plan Commission President and Plan Commissioners. I appreciate all of your time and work and hard and effort throughout the summer on these. Um, you know, we've had several workshops, um, a lengthy public comment period, and um, uh, quite a lot of discussion around these nine applications. So this is kind of the summation of all of that work. So, uh, you know, give your give yourselves a pat on the back. There's a lot to read. There's a lot to review. And take a deep breath because uh, we are going to go through hopefully all nine today. Um, 
Before we get uh, any further, though, I'd like to just highlight some things that you've received today and some things you received last week. So we did have two um, late comment letters that I provided to you in the agenda packet. Uh, one was from Ms. Dakota concerning the application on, on, on the South Hill and Southgate neighborhood. The other was uh, one from Mr. Schramm concerning the one on 10th Avenue in the Cliff Cannon neighborhood. Um, so those are in the agenda packet. And then you've received a bevy of additional comment letters that we've received today, uh, yesterday and today. Um, so uh, you should all have received those in your email. I just wanted to highlight that those are not on the staff report because they came in after the staff report, but we will get them up online for the public to review uh, as soon as we can. It does take a day or two to do that. Um, on a quick note, there is a letter from a Miss O'Neill. Um, completely my fault, not her fault. It, uh, as a, through a clerical error, it was left off the staff report, but her letter was submitted during the comment period and before the staff reports. So uh, my apologies to Miss O'Neill and to you uh, the plan commission, but um, you should have all of those for you. So today um, I'm going to do a real quick recap since uh, plan commission president did, a, did a, his own at the beginning here, but I'm going to go over how these will work, how the, the agenda and the procedure for each of the, of the applications. Very quickly, I'd like to run through the decision criteria for everyone again. These are the, these are the criteria that uh, the municipal code suggests you keep in mind and that you utilize when making your ultimate recommendation on these applications. And then we will go through each of the applications in turn. Hey, Kevin. Uh, yes. My apologies for interrupting. No problem. Uh, but maybe before we get too deep in this, you know, I, I might have erred and, and, and not adhered to our, our plan commission hearing procedure. So maybe if, if James, you know, Mr. Richmond, if, if you could weigh in on this, I, I indicated, and we had discussed before the meeting, that perhaps we could keep the, the, the written record the written open, record. but our, our plan commission hearing procedures that were kind of an addendum adopted August 24th, 2016, you know, to our, our normal rules, say very clear that uh, there's no public testimony allowed following a rebuttal. So I just want to maybe, while you're presenting, have James and Lewis perhaps weigh in on that. So thank you. But if you're, Please go ahead. We can, we can, we can okay. go back before we, before we get into public testimony on this first one. I just wanted to give James a moment to answer if he was going to. So, um, so what you see here is this, the project website. Uh, this is for the public as well. Uh, if you want to see the details, all of the materials are online except for those newest comment letters, uh, including all the staff reports. And of course, the comprehensive plan itself, which is what we are here to talk about, is always available at shapingspokane.org. Uh, so very quickly, as we've already covered them, the hearing procedures, we're going to take each of these applications in turn in numerical order. Um, I will give a presentation on them. You, uh, this, this plan commissioners, you've seen this before. There's no, there's no, uh, you know, surprise ending to any of these, but um, it's also to familiarize the, the public with what the application is and it will help inform the testimony. Following my presentation, the applicant's given the opportunity to speak. Uh, and then after that, typically we take public testimony and then of course the applicant has an opportunity to respond to any of the testimony if they feel uh, it's necessary. Uh, so moving on into the decision criteria, again, you've seen these before, but I wanted to make sure they were nice and fresh in your mind. Um, we have several, uh, A through K, that are set forth in the municipal code. Some of them are simple, some of them are less so. Um, the first couple are, are really about state federal law. So the first one is it's consistent with the law. The second is that it's consistent with the Growth Management Act, which is also a law. So, you know, a little redundancy, but it's all good. Um, the next is that infrastructure needs to reflect, if we need them, are needed in, are reflected in the CIP. We didn't have any applications that indicated uh, uh, anything except for um, a slight road plan, uh, which is a mitigation measure for future development. So it doesn't have to be done now. Um, also, that if there's a change due to a funding shortfall that we have to include public input, there are no proposals this year that are related to funding shortfalls. Uh, the, the proposal has to be internally consistent with the comprehensive plan, consistent with regional plans and policies, so those of our neighbors. Um, the cumulative effects must be considered, CEPA review has to be completed, and there must be adequate public facilities available. And then if there's a change to an urban growth area, it can only come from the council or mayor. Uh, we don't have any proposed changes to the UGA, so Jay's not gonna come into play. All the rest, 
Uh, an analysis of all of the rest has been provided in the staff report which we presented two weeks ago. Um, the last criteria is probably the most weighty for a lot of the applications that we see, and that is that the need for the change has been demonstrated. Um, and it gives specific language as to how we should consider policy changes and how we should consider map changes. Um, policy changes typically, where we, the city should adopt policy changes when it uh, it allows the city to better achieve that the, the community's vision. Uh, we do, don't have any policy changes this time, but we do have some text amendments. Uh, also, there's the, for map changes, um, the, the probably the most um, applicable one or the most uh, stringent one is this confirmation. It must conform to the location requirements of the comprehensive plan. As you know, some of our policies have specific language as to where they where certain land uses or zoning can be applied, uh, or land uses, sorry. Um, and so we, we do look at that. Again, the analysis is in the staff report. Um, also, we look at whether the site is suitable for the type of development allowed and whether it, the change will implement comp plan policy better than use and zoning. So just, just as a, uh, you know, I'm going to say this a lot, but mo all of the analysis from staff is available in the staff reports. I'm not going to be hitting that real heavy today. I'm just going to be hitting things in summary, and we can, we can discuss more if you want uh, as, we, as we move through the process. Are there any questions from plan commissioners on the criteria or the procedures before I get into our first application? All right, not seeing any waving on screen or any chats. Uh, let's go ahead and move on into the applications. So this year we have six land use and zoning amendment changes. These are from the uh, general public that, that, or they were requested by the general public. You can see them here on this map. Uh, there's, there's six of them throughout the city. Uh, we also have some map and text amendments proposed by the city for the bicycle master plan, which is an appendix to the comprehensive plan, so it's part of the comp plan. Uh, we have a, a, a minor text amendment in chapter four for transportation around safety for at, at grade railroad crossings. And then we have a, a series of, of amendments to the arterial network map, which is also in chapter four. So the, uh, the red dots on the map, those, are, those were all initiated by members of the public. And the ones on the right, the three on the right, those are all city sponsored. And we're gonna go ahead and take these in application order, which means the first one is Z19499 COMP. This one's on Liberty Avenue. Uh, it, you can see the red star on the map there. It's general location. It's just north of the river in District 1 in the northeast part of the city. Uh, we have an area of, a, of 0.58 acres. It's two complete parcels and a portion of a third parcel. Uh, it's, you can see it here on this image. Um, it currently contains, let me see if I can get my handy-dandy laser pointer to work. It currently contains a single-family residence. Um, the remainder of it is mostly undeveloped except for this parking lot for an existing commercial or a retail, I think it's a restaurant use on Market Street. Um, and so what the, uh, the, the site itself is kind of half developed. Uh, most of it is, is, is just grass. Uh, zooming out a little bit, you can kind of see this is Market Street. Market Street is where that major north-south um, arterial that runs um, through the Hilliard area to the north. Um, this railroad track you see in the east is where the North Spokane corridor will be, the new freeway. And it is, uh, it has, there are homes to the west and the southwest. There's this mix of homes and commercial uses all around it. Uh, some of the properties to the north are homes, some are commercial. Um, there's a large retail or commercial facility here on the corner of Market Liberty, but there's homes right behind it. So it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a mixed area. Uh, and it's all within the Bemis neighborhood. However, it's right on the boundary of uh, um, Minnehaha. So we asked, the, so the, the applicant has done outreach to both neighborhoods. The site itself, again, is largely grass. This is standing in the northwest corner looking down on the property. You can see this small house that's on the property. And then this commercial use here is existing and not part of the application, but it is owned by the same owners. Here you can see that, uh, that kind of tavern uh, or, or restaurant facility. This is standing on the corner of the adjacent property that they own um, looking northwest. 
the uh, the proposal the, the three pieces are currently these three parcels are currently designated for residential four to ten that's four to ten dwelling units per acre the the applicant would like to uh, fold those areas into the general commercial area that runs north south along Market Street here you can see that most of the block is already designated as general commercial they're trying to they would like to bring this last corner into the general commercial land use designation uh, the zoning that will be changed uh, that would be changed along with the land use is currently general commercial zoning with a 70 foot height limit everywhere except these three parcels on that block they'd like of course to fold it into the general commercial 70. Um, so you can kind of see this soft edge general commercial zoning um, this this parcel is one of those that's just on that sawtooth to the west side of, of market street uh, we put this out we put all of the applicants applications out for agency comments uh, the spokane tribe was uh would a note that they would like any future development to include a, a a site survey to look for cultural resources that's a pretty typical request um, of course this this proposal is not proposing any development at this time it's just a land use and zoning change uh, we didn't receive any other comments of other concerns from agencies or from the neighborhood chair or neighborhood council i apologize um, public comments we received several comment cards in opposition you'll see those attached to your staff report the comment cards simply say we oppose this project we did not receive any details from the public as to why they opposed it necessarily um, and no no direct letters or any other uh, outreach um, as you can see in the analysis in the staff report, the ultimate conclusion of staff was that we do recommend that, that, that this, uh, this proposal be approved. Um, I, the applicant for this one is actually the agent for the applicant is uh, Storehog Engineering. And uh, I'm, I don't have my participant list open to see if they're here, but if they'd like to speak, this would be a good time. Oh, yeah, Liam Taylor. Uh, howdy. From Storehog. Yep. Okay. So first of all, um, thank you to the planning commission for your time and Kevin, thank you very much for, uh, giving up that, uh, extremely detailed summary. Um, not much else to point out. Um, I would like to address that, um, existing general commercial corridor. It's kind of an unofficial corridor. So, um, you know, it's, it's not too much of a stretch to, to pull that part or that zoning three parcels to the west. Um, I'll give you a little insight on, um, although, you know, nothing's official, um, our applicant is planning on developing 23 to 24 apartment units on site um, with the existing restaurant on the east to remain. There were some concerns that the applicant uh, was going to construct a new restaurant, but um, we can uh, put those worries aside. Um, as you can see, it's uh, maybe if you um, recall from that last exhibit, there's some light industrial zoning to the Northwest. It's kind of a, as Kevin said, it's a very mixed area. So um, some mild multi, oh, thank you. Some mild multi, uh, uh, some multifamily wouldn't be too um, uh, standout-ish in this neighborhood. Um, uh, yeah, um, not really much. Um, Kevin did a great job summarizing it up, um, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. I have a question. So in the initial application, I know that not looking at specific development, just the land use component, but can you the applicant had talked about a mixed use case here. Is there, is there a mixed use idea now just the fact that the restaurant will remain and then the West parcels will be apartments or were they just looking at, are they looking at commercial use underneath the apartments at all? Or is that a dead concept? So great question. Um, I'll, as, as appealing as um, a mixed development would be, um, looks like you said the commercial on the bottom and residential on the top. Um, our applicant is um, steering more towards um, purely residential for the the three westerly parcels. 
Okay, thanks. Okay. Kevin, I have, I have a question, I think probably for you that I probably should ask during the workshop, but um, mm -hmm. during the docketing process or on council, did they ever consider extending that line all the way down to Euclid or, or was that not ever discussed? It wasn't brought up. Um, okay. We did we did talk about expansions on some of uh, the applications. In fact, two of them we expanded, uh, the city expanded, but um, not on this one. Okay, thank you. Okay. So thank you, uh, thank you, Liam, for, for adding in there. I appreciate it. Um, next would be, of course, public testimony. And I do, I do not know, Jackie, did we have anybody sign up for this one? Uh, Kevin, before we open up for public testimony, um, maybe James and Lewis, did you have a <laughs> an opinion on oh yeah on the question <laughs> uh, if we could take some sorry, testimony sorry, I guess I didn't understand your question well I, I think we had we had discussed before in our planning in planning meeting for the for the hearing was the option of of keeping the written open after the the rebuttal by the applicant but but I think it's Pretty clear if you read it in the plan commission hearing procedures. The the, the adopted August 24, 2016. Um, that's not allowed. Is that your interpretation? Yeah, I think it's best um, to to have public testimony and allow the applicant to rebut that and then close the record. Okay. Um, as a as a practical matter, the record. Um, the, the real record is, is open until the city council takes action. So um, yeah. if there's additional comments somebody wants to make that they feel like they failed to make here, they can always make those to the city council. Okay. Yeah, that, that helps. Thank you. Lewis, do you agree? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Not to Wait, I mean, can I ask a question then? Please. So if, if written testimony comes in, after we close the record, are we to ignore that? Or, I mean, if, it, if we see it, is that part of our consideration or do we ignore it? You know, <clears throat> technically it's not part of the record before you. So technically it, it shouldn't be um, part of your consideration. Um, but again, that information will be made available. Uh, I'm assuming that any, anything that comes in, even after our record closes, will be forwarded to the city council, and um, people are free to continue um, commenting to the city council all the way up to the night of their hearing on the matter. So, um, if there's some new information that comes to light, it can certainly um, be shared with uh, the decision makers between now and then. From staff's perspective, Greg, just to clarify, if if we receive comment directly, like as you know, as we're typically the conduit for the for the comments coming in, we will hold them for counsel. But I will I after once you uh, once the planning commission closes the record, I will stop forwarding them to you uh, because the record's closed at that point. So it, it would only be if somebody went directly around me or around staff. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Planning Commission President, are we good to start public testimony? Yes, please. Okay. Jackie, do you have anyone? We did not have anybody sign up for this amendment. Okay, so I, I heard, Jackie, we was faint, but I, I heard that we don't have anyone signed up. Um, is anyone from the public, would anyone from the public on the WebEx or on phone like to testify that Hasn't yet indicated. Yes. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, please state your name and, and uh, an address in the city of Spokane, and then uh, feel, please feel free. We'll, we'll, we'll start a three minute uh, timer. Thank you. Tell them your name. Hi, my name is Joe Speranzi. 
Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, basically, I've lived in this area since 1973, and um, we're across the street from, um, from the proposed area. And I just want to say that commercial activities have no place in a residential area. Every neighbor that we went around to around here signed a, a paper asking the, the area to be, to be labeled as, as residential. And uh, we'd like you to look very seriously at doing that. Putting something in commercial uh, adds noises, disrupts peace, disrupts quiet, and just makes a big mess of things. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate taking time. Uh, anyone else like to uh, testify? Yeah. Um, my name is Kathy. I live right across the street. And Kathy, to me, I'm it's sorry to interrupt, Kathy. Can you please state your, your full name for the record? Kathy Foley. Thank you. And I've got a real problem with it becoming apartments because they can, I mean, it's right next door to me. It's right across the street. And it's really going to disturb the neighborhood, I'm afraid. So I really oppose it. And that bar has been nothing but a headache for us for years, and we don't want any more headache. I'm done. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I, are you referring to a property on the corner of Market and Liberty, just, just uh, to understand better? Yeah, but he also owns the the bar, and we haven't had an issue with the bar recently, but in the past, it's really been a headache. That's all I was saying about that, but okay. it's been great now. Oh, thank you for, for that. Okay. Appreciate your okay. your testimony. Um, right. Anyone else, if, if you're on the phone, uh, you have to uh, use star three uh, to unmute, I believe, if you're trying to communicate. Anyone else? Okay, we see a lot of call-in users, so we just want to just give it a little bit here in case there's a... I think Jackie's just opening up the lines there in case you wanna speak, just... Okay, carefully moving forward. Okay. Everyone comfortable moving forward? Okay, I'll give it back to you, Kevin. Um, so now would now would be the time to, um, if there if the applicant would like to give a, a rebuttal at all, and we ask that you would limit it to to anything addressed by by the the current verbal testimony. Um, sh sure. So again, this is Liam Taylor with Storehouse Engineering, uh, five ten East Third Avenue. Um, just uh, to address those comments, um, the first one, uh, uh, I can assure you that, um, uh, as I stated earlier, um, the mixed use residential commercial is um, off the table for the client. It'll be only residential. And um, uh, to address the second comment, um, uh, we, we appreciate the concern and uh, we hear you and um, you know this is a markets it's a very busy street um, Liberty Ave is right to a park I'm sure there's lots of traffic daily um, but uh, you know this is uh, won't have an incredible impact on the noise and uh, surrounding area but um, we greatly appreciate your concern and uh, that will be forwarded on to the 
the client. But with that, um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your time. So with that, Kevin, if, if we're okay to close the record, we will uh, close the verbal and written uh, record for, I'm sorry, did I hear someone? Yeah, before we do that, can I ask a question? Sure, please. Since, and I guess this is, goes back to Liam, on, since mixed use is off the table and it would just be apartments, would there be a potential consideration to move it to RMF instead of general commercial? So I think that's um, that's, a, that's a fair question. Um, we didn't want to create a pocket zone of, um, you know, an awkward amount of, you know, three parcels of multifamily. Um, as I'm sure you guys know, uh, multifamily or residential is allowed in general commercial zone. So uh, I think for simplicity stakes uh, and to, like I said, to avoid that pocket zone, uh, we decided to just go with general commercial. Does that answer your question? It does. It, the trouble is that there's no lock on actual use once the rezone occurs, and so it could become a gas station. Um, so RMF would actually make it to assure that it would be um, residential, and it would also create buffer between the general commercial areas and the residential, the lower intensity residential areas, which is a consideration of land use 1.8. That's probably too much deliberation. <laughs> but I, well, yeah, I, no, I, I think it's a fair question, Greg, right? And I think James and Kevin will tell us that it's obviously it's outside of our consideration right now, but I think it's a, it's a valid question to understand um, why the application was made in terms of GC. Maybe maybe that's a way to ask that question, Greg. So you're, yeah, to, to, to tell you, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, if I could just just procedurally, so plan commission's recommendation can take one of three flavors. Uh, you can approve. You can approve with recommended changes um, or conditions, is what the code says, um, at, or you can recommend denial. And if plan commission so wishes, it is within your, your purview to say you recommend approval with the condition that it be uh, residential 15 to 30 instead of residential 4 to 10. So it's, it's within the scope of what you can talk about um, as to the, the appropriateness of which, uh, which use, that's kind of between, that's kind of up to the, the, the deliberation that you guys are going to go through in the future. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, this is James mm. uh, Richmond. Yes, sir. Would, <clears throat> would um, going with a, a high density residential classification uh, bring comp plan policies in place that you haven't looked at on this application? Yeah, it would. Uh, it would bring in the one. Um, let me pull it up real quick for higher density residential, which has similar. Um, Similar tones to LU 1.8. Let me uh, find it for us here. Well, that, uh, this is Joanne. I, I, that was going to be my comment. I don't think it'd be consistent with comprehensive plan policy if it was higher density residential, because it needs to be, you know, surrounded or close to other high density residential. This is consistent uh, with uh, commercial because it's surrounded or close to being surrounded. Marshall. Is that correct, Kevin? Yeah, so the LU 1.8 has, has language in it to allow that kind of um, expansion in certain conditions as long as certain things are covered, which is what we talked about in the workshop. Let me see if I can pull that up. We're really starting um, to get into deliberations here. Yeah, yeah we I'd really I'd encourage are. us to keep moving on, and we'll come back to all of these after we've heard all, all testimony on all the applications. Thank yeah, what, what I would suggest for the plan commissioners as we as we keep moving forward is uh, if you want to look at the staff report in the, in the list of uh, one of the exhibits, one of the early exhibits in all of the staff reports are the policies that, have, that apply. And if you look at one of the other applications that has multifamily, that policy is in there. It's LU 1.4. Okay, so we're going to move on. I think that's a good discussion. Any anyone else with a question before we uh, close the record? Okay.
Okay. Okay. So with that, then now let's close close the verbal and written uh, uh, record for Z one nine four nine nine. And then uh, Kevin, can we if we can move on to the next one, please? Terrific. So the next application Z one nine five zero one C O M P. This one's on the corner northeast corner of Nevada and Decatur. Uh, this is a private, another private application for a land use plan map change. This one's further north, right south of Francis. Um, and what we're looking at here is a half, about a half an acre, which um, you'll see the red boundary are the parcels that the applicant is requesting that we change. The same property owner owns these two properties to the north that are on Francis, but there is a city alleyway between them, which is why these two boundaries don't touch. So. So there's, uh, there's a city alley. Um, the, the site itself currently contains two single family homes that I believe are rented. Um, there's a kind of an unofficial drive aisle through this property that goes north to the parking lot for the commercial use on the corner. Um, so that's what we're looking at. Zooming out a little bit, you can see that Francis to the west, uh, these larger, this is a retail uh, kind of area. Let me turn on my pointer so it's a little brighter. There we go. So this is a uh, kind of a retail strip mall kind of setup with a gas station, um, but there's there's a lot of industrial commercial. This is a Maverick gas station to the north, but moving east from the property, there's still a lot of single family, um, maybe not on the north side of Francis, but it is right on the northern edge of a large area of single family homes. Uh, here's a, a quick picture of the two homes that are on the site. Um, and then this is standing in the northwest corner on, on the right. This is a, this looks a little weird because it's a panorama image. So this is actually 180 degrees, but this is looking south on Nevada. You can see the homes, uh, the outbuildings, and then this is the city alleyway that is un currently unpaved and then the commercial use to the north. The proposal is the current, uh, the current land use is residential four to 10 units per acre. The proposal would be to fold it into the uh, general commercial uses that are along Francis and Nevada. Uh, as far as zoning goes, the southern half of Francis is, uh, to the west is community business with a 55 foot height limit. The commercial properties to the north that are owned by the same entity, uh, that's also CB55. The proposal would be to change the zoning of these two properties to match. So that's community business, 55 feet. Uh, this one is uh, is going to hinge on LU 1.8. Uh, I was talking about that criteria K with the um, you know that it's appropriately cited per the, the the location requirements of the comprehensive plan. LU 1.8, as you'll recall, we amended last year to kind of kind of provide uh, some shape to how exceptions can be done. This property is not in a center or corridor, and so. Generally, 1.8 calls for general commercial uses to be in a corridor or, or center, but it does allow some exception. Uh, it says here, except, uh, recognizing existing investments, giving deference to existing land use patterns, exceptions may be allowed uh, for, certain, for certain areas. So um, in this case, staff did not provide an, a recommendation uh, because the relationship of this proposal to 1.8 and to the comp plan is something that we would request the plan commission discuss and determine. Um, as far as comments go during the agency neighborhood period, uh, we didn't, with the Spokane tribe didn't have any concerns, significant concerns. The Shiloh Hills chair did uh, provide a comment letter asking that access, that the alleyway be retained and then access be limited to, to uh, Decatur. Um, just as a side note, uh, this is not a development proposal, so obviously the, the, the discussion in the staff board isn't super deep on that, but um, just keep in mind. And then Whitman, the Whitman neighborhood chair uh, issued a letter of support. We received no public comments on this. And again, as I said, staff did not have a recommendation on this proposal. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them or we, I can hand it off to Mr. Hume, who is the agent for the applicant. Not seeing any. Dwight, would you like to uh, say a few words? Thank you, Kevin. Um, the, uh, the property has been purchased uh, over the course of years. I actually own another lot to the south. 
I'm getting a double echo in here. Are you guys hearing me okay? Yeah. Okay. And the uh, the intent of, of the uh, request is to enable, first of all, to get the house or the existing uh, commercial building away from the intersection. It has been the victim of numerous uh, car wrecks uh, that end up in the building or on it. And it's not that the building was built that close to the road. It was built back in the 60s when both Nevada and Francis were much smaller rights of way. The city has expanded those. And as a result, uh, in basically encroached upon the uh, safe usability of that building. The market for this type of, of site uh, given the uh, intensity of, of the volume of traffic in this intersection, which uh, is such that many uh, people would like to put a new use on this site if it were much bigger as proposed. The alley is not a factor in terms of site planning for a new use. That use, of course, would be moved away from the intersection and placed uh, uh, away from uh, that, uh, closer to the east line, and uh, enable better ingress and egress and visibility and most of all safety. Um, the renters in both of those houses um, have been uh, there for, well, particularly the one on Nevada has been there for many, many years. Um, and the landlord, the applicant, has uh, given them a break on rent just because of the undesirable use of that property uh, next to Nevada. There's literally vibration and and uh, noise and fumes and so on because of the proximity to the traffic that during the uh, PM commute will back up waiting for the light. So it's not a desirable residential site. Um, more importantly, it's, it's an effort to get a uh, expansion to uh, respond to the market demand for uh, a more usable site. We can leave the alley in. That's not a problem. I was under the impression in talking with the neighborhood council that they were wanting to uh, be sure that the alley would be there, but I didn't ever get from them that it was a restricted access, uh, at least in their recommendations. But that's something we can deal with in site planning. For now, the other aspect of that uh, alley is that uh, traffic waiting to get through the intersection on a red light will oftentimes just uh, detour through the site and get over to Francis and go east. As you can see in the aerial photo, there's very little land use in that block. Um, and I think the other aspect of this that I want you to pay uh, to factor in is the volume of traffic on Nevada. Uh, and just as what I said earlier about the residential use, uh, it's not desirable for residential use. And Nevada should be treated much the same as, as Francis as a uh, arterial frontage and allow better utilization uh, and uh, accessibility for non-residential use. Don't really have anything else to add to that. Uh, oh, I, I would say that the uh, policy language of LU 1.8, as you know, was recently changed uh, in its former uh, language it fit this site hand in glove. Uh, that is to say, the old language used to factor in how much volume of traffic, which this one would qualify for. And also, it factored in the expansion to allow it to a, a depth equal to 250 feet or the next parallel street, in this case, Decatur parallels Francis. And so it would have fit much as it always did in the language of LU 1.8 in the past. I know we can't use that anymore, but uh, realize that that was the language in the past that was used to justify other rezones to commercial. 
and the uh, uh, effort here is to match the zoning that we have on the other part, the uh, community of CB 55, I think, and, uh, and have the same zoning uh, to the south. And that's about all I have right now, unless you have questions. Kevin, when can we make a comment? Sorry, go ahead, Michael, if you, if you have a question. Well, I would like to make a comment in response to Mr. Hume's comments. Okay, um, as long as we're not delivering it, absolutely. Please go ahead. <clears throat> I think that we have to look at this, look at the map. It's an, an intrusion into a, a residential neighborhood. Um, the, the area west of Decatur is all filled with, with residential homes. The area south of Decatur is. And I think this is an intrusion into a residential neighborhood. Yeah, we should continue to take public testimony if we can from the general public. And then we'll come back and do deliberations on all of these after we've gone through taking testimony from uh, on all the applications. Lewis, if we have questions, is it better now or after public testimony? If there are questions, um, I believe we can ask them now of commission members. Uh, but uh, okay. generally, if we're going to deep dive into discussion about um, how the uh, decision criteria apply to the project, that needs to occur during deliberations. That's why I asked when it was appropriate or not. Oh, okay. So, sorry, Michael. But thank you for for that. We'll we'll save that for deliberation. I, I have hey, a James James Richmond here. I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. If you have questions for the applicant, this is the time to raise them. Okay. I have a quick question just because it came up from council member mom during workshop. Uh, do we have any new information on uh, potential from a spot on whether or not if Francis ever moves into, into a highway, um, whether or not that should be considered in this process, if, if, that, if that setback or that actual right away increase? Is that a question for staff? I most likely, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, not I, I. I would I would defer to uh, Director Mueller on this. I, I don't. I have not received any concrete information as to that. Yeah, we should be working with the information uh, that is before us now and not speculating about future changes to transportation or land use systems. Okay, that, that helps clarify. I was, I was confused when that question was asked during workshop and it was entertained. So, okay, thank you. Okay, yes, uh, so with that, um, if there are no other questions for Mr. Hume, thank you. Uh, and then we can move into public testimony. Uh, do we have anyone on, on our list that indicated they'd like to speak to this? Yes, we do. We have a Chris Bornhoft signed up. I see Chris. Thank you. So you feel free to uh, testify. Hi, uh, this is Chris Bornhoft. Um, address is 2829 South Grand Boulevard. Um, I'm working with the owners of this property to help them develop it for its highest and best use. I guess just a, a couple of comments. Dwight alluded to it before. The owners actually own other residential lots in this neighborhood, and so the intention is to look at moving these two homes onto those lots uh, to, to not lose any housing, but to actually take some vacant lots and, and create housing on those spots. Uh, so hopefully that addresses that issue. Um, as we look at trying to expand Spokane and, you know, uh, attract new businesses to Spokane, I think we have to realize what businesses are looking for. Uh, and this is a perfect example of that. Um, a lot of businesses are looking for lighted intersections. They want high traffic counts. They want concrete, you know, on all four corners. Um, and they need big one acre lots that are sort of squared off. And with the current zoning plan, cutting the block in half, um, it doesn't really lend itself for us to go out and attract, you know, some of these businesses. And this could be anything from an auto parts store that would serve the neighborhood 
to a pharmacy or like a Walgreens or CVS or even, you know, if we can make it maybe even a Chick-fil-A or something like that. Um, across the street to the north, uh, it was also talked about before, Maverick, uh, which is a commercial site. If you look at how deep their lot is, they extend all the way back to what would essentially be the, the street behind it, so kind of the same density and the same depth. That's just how much room commercial needs. Now, I would agree with Mr. Baker's comment earlier, you know, intruding into the neighborhood. Uh, it might seem odd if you did that in the middle of the block, but I think when you're on a, a hard corner, as we call it, in the development world, you know, trying to accommodate some of these tenants that people want are, are the things that we're trying to do. Um, so um, it, it's not a great use, as we mentioned, for residential single family. It's a much better use for commercial. And really what we would do, as Dwight mentioned, is try to keep the building uh, on the north side uh, of that alleyway. That would make the most sense from a site planning standpoint and use the south half of this lot south of the alley as a parking lot. So the intention would not be to build a big building on the south half, but more use it for parking. Okay, any questions for Mr. Bornoff? Um, could you also, could you um, again stay yes, here? I'm sorry. I'm yes, sorry, I have a question. Please, go ahead. Um, do you folks have any um, intentions of requesting a vacancy of that alleyway in the future? I. I don't imagine that we will. The difficulty of trying to vacate an alleyway when you have to get approval from all neighbors, both directions, I'm not sure that it's um, something that we'd want to tackle. I think the, the smarter move would be to try to work with that alleyway and, and keep that access open. It also provides us you know, access onto um, Nevada. I can't say for sure that the owners wouldn't do that, but I think the possibility of that is, is highly unlikely. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Well, thank you for your, for your testimony and your time. Yeah, thank you. I don't see anyone else on the list. Is, is anyone else on the, on the call or on the WebEx that would like to testify to this? Okay, hearing none, then we will uh, close the testimony on Z19501. Terrific. All right. The next application, Z19502, COMP. This is uh, right on 29th and Ray. This, uh, this you'll see here is in, the, uh, is in District 2. It's in the southeast quarter of the city. Um, this one is a combined private and city application. As you'll recall in the threshold process, we, uh, the city uh, went ahead and added two parcels to this, and I'll, I'll allude to that here in just a second. But just know that this is both a private aspect and a uh, city-sponsored aspect to it. So we are looking at uh, an area of about 0.4 acres. It's split about equally among the uh, private and public parts of this application. Uh, this is all in the Lincoln Heights neighborhood. The uh, private applicant concerned these two parcels here. That this aerial photo shows a house. Um, please note that home is no longer there. This this site is now vacant, um, and it is on the northeast corner of Ray and 29th. And as I said before, the city had expanded this to include two additional properties. Uh, most of this expansion is this parking lot you see behind the retail use on Ray and 29th, um, and a little sliver of this person's backyard uh, that uh, that would just in order to complete the uh, the zone. And I'll show you how that works in just a second. Um, on the private application side of it, on the northeast side of Ray and 29th. There is a city right of way for an alley in this location. It is completely unimproved. In fact, the grade difference in there is pretty extreme. Uh, and there's, so there's no paving. There's, you couldn't even drive it with a four wheel drive if you wanted to. Zooming out a little bit, you can see here on the west side, um, 
along 29th, of course, there's, there's just numerous office and retail uses on the west here. We have the beginnings of what is the Lincoln Heights Center. Um, there's a lot of multifamily in this area. There's a lot of office and retail in this area. Everything to the north, to the east, and to the south is single-family residential. You do see some larger buildings like uh, this to the, to the north. Um, on Ray, those are typically churches and schools, which are permitted in a single-family uh, zone area. Um, most of the commercial and office use is to the west. This site itself, like I said, this is the private site. Uh, again, a panorama shot um, showing that the home was removed by permit uh, before the application was submitted, so quite a while ago. Um, this is kind of a semi-accurate or semi-recent aerial photograph you can see here. This is the private application. This is two properties, but it's the same application that's currently vacant. And here on the left, you can see the parking lot and the little strip of backyard that would also be included by the city. The proposal is to take it from its current designation, land use map plan, use plan map designation, which is residential four to 10 units per acre, and to change the land use plan map designation to office. These parcels added by the city, they were expressly added because of this little notch in this office area. They were the last piece of that side of Ray that was not zoned office. Um, the private applicant would like to also include these two properties into the resident or into the office designation. So, here we go. Uh, during the agency neighborhood comment period, the Spokane tribe did not have any serious concerns. The neighborhood chair communicated uh, her opposition to the project. We received multiple public comments in opposition during the public comment period. All of those, uh, except for the very newest ones that we received today, all of those are in the staff report. Um, their concerns were around site access, tra traffic, intrusion into the neighborhood, um, quite, a, uh, yeah, quite a few different uh, concerns repeated amongst a lot of the letters. Um, as you can see in the staff report uh, following our analysis, um, it, it does not appear that the private application conforms to the decision criteria, so at this time staff does not recommend that be approved. As far as the city application goes, um, it does seem to conform to the criteria and to the, the location requirements of the comp plan policies for office uses, and so we recommended approval of that one. Before we get to the applicant presentation, does the Planning Commission have any questions? Just to be clear, these are separate ownerships, right? Yeah, the, um, the private application is all owned by one uh, individual or one entity. The parking lot is owned by uh, Etux, which owns the use on the corner, which I believe is currently a dental office. And then the owner of this residence owns this small strip of this backyard that, that the city's sponsored application would rezone and change the land use for. Um, I made attempts to contact both Etux and this resident and received no reply after a couple letters and phone calls. Uh, again, for the next uh, for the next four, Mr. Hume is the agent. So, uh, Mr. Hume, do you have anything to add? Thank you. Uh, the application uh, at this location, from my many many years of experience of doing zone changes, incidentally, I did, I did represent this site um, back in the early '90s, I think it was, for uh, the late G.G. Snyder, who had the dental office on the south east corner, excuse me, southwest corner, the, uh, one of the things that I've, that's kind of unique about this is uh, numerous inquiries I've had uh, as to when this zoning will be done so it can be purchased. And so the demand is there, and once again, like Francis and, and uh, Nevada, it's, uh, it just needs to be, the zoning tool needs to be in place to allow it to happen. The theme of the opposition is we don't want uh, office zoning or non-residential to jump Ray Street and go to the east side. And uh, staff pointed out there isn't any non-residential zoning down to 37th 
and yet there are a lot of non-residential uses between 29th and 17th on this side of the street. Daycare, fire stations, churches, um, interspersed between houses. This site is is something that because of the channelization and whatnot at, uh, in the streets is a right in right outside. It's not something that's conducive to uh, uh, convenience use. It would have to be a point destination office uh, and consequently it'd be a fairly quiet uh, activity compared to apartments or uh, certainly we're not entertaining it, but uh, some type of retail. Um, keep in mind that office is a, not only is there a public demand for it, the marketplace, but it's used over and over again, such as it has been along Francis as a transitional land use to the residential behind it. Um, nothing different here. There had been concern by some uh, speaking against this, saying that once this happens, then it's just going to continue east. I would say that that's impractical because of the lack of visibility uh, for a non-residential use. It needs the frontages of Ray and 29th to do anything successfully. So we think it's a good corner. Um, by the way, uh, in the last effort uh, years ago, uh, the Planning Commission voted in favor of it. Uh, that was before gross management, by the way. But um, And then council had a split vote on it and didn't approve it because they were concerned about uh, the fact that the Lincoln Heights plan didn't go to that side of the street. Anyway, that said, it's a, I always uh, rely upon market forces uh, to tell us what really should be happening land use wise. And in this case, that's exactly what uh, uh, seems to be popular. Uh, and many different uh, individuals have uh, expressed the desire to have this as their uh, uh, personal office space. So it is a good transition to residential. It's a limited site in terms of accessibility. It's, uh, you might say, trending. You've got offices directly across the street to the west on 29th. There's no real reason why it shouldn't be uh, similar land use. One of the, I will say this too, one of the other uh, requests that I've uh, had an inquiry on is uh, from the office building to the southwest corner, the dental office. They'd like to have it as a parking area for their employees so that they had more patient parking space on the site that they're located on, and that could be uh, happening as well. Once again, there's something that the Planning Commission, I wish you could revisit and change your code. It used to be, uh, as it is right there on the uh, city-sponsored uh, rezone, uh, historically that was a special permit for parking in a residential zone. And uh, it's a very appropriate way to um, solve problems on on off street uh, or yeah off street parking. I'll stop. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Questions from the commissioners to Mr. Hume. Okay. Um, okay. Hearing none, uh, I think we can move into public testimony then. I see uh, we have one. Uh, Ms. Kimmel Tomsic, I, I, I believe you're on. Yes, I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? We can, please. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, I am speaking against the proposed comp plan amendment to rezone the northeast corner of 29th and Ray from residential to office. I have lived two blocks from the northeast corner of 29th and Ray for 21 years. I work and walk in the neighborhood. This area is a residential neighborhood. The lot in the northeast corner of 29th and Ray is located on a city block lined with single family houses, and there is a neighborhood park and walking distance. A long existing house on the property was demolished. 
the city is preparing a housing action plan to encourage the construction of affordable housing. The plan builds on previous housing discussions related to the comprehensive plan. Our city needs affordable housing in residential areas, not office space or parking lots. I want to remind the Planning Commission, the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council wrote a letter in support of residents opposed to the proposed comp plan amendment zoning change. The letter stated, the residents have successfully fought against two previous attempts to rezone the residential property to office in 1984 and 1993. The east side of Ray Street is a historically designated residential buffer from 17th to Ferris High School. There is no trending in terms of land use on the east side of Ray. The two churches, school, daycares, and fire stations are all appropriate and residential. Ray is a principal arterial and a residential boundary. Office zoning should not cross a principal arterial into a residential neighborhood where there is no commercial or office property. The proposed rezoning will set a precedent and retail and office will creep into the historically designated retail buffer. Per the city's municipal code, an office zoning on small sites in or near residential areas is intended to have few detrimental impacts on the neighborhood. There are limited car movements due to the concrete barriers at the intersection of 29th and Ray. The proposed office zoning will divert traffic into a residential neighborhood. The diverted traffic is a safety concern. There is a lack of sidewalks and unpaved streets. Please protect our neighborhood and vote against the proposed comp plan amendment. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Carol, are you speaking for yourself or for the neighborhood? Um, I'm speaking now for myself, but I just want to remind you that the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council did write a letter that's in your packet that agrees with everything I said. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Ms. Tomsek. Okay, thank you for your well-organized testimony. Uh, anyone else that's on the WebEx or the or phone? Okay, I hear clatter, but uh, I think hearing none, I I think we can close out uh, record on Z one nine five zero two. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, Kevin, please. All righty. So the next application, Z19503COMP. This one is on 53rd Avenue in the Southgate neighborhood. You'll see the from the star here, we're right on the edge of the city here, um, just actually just north of it. Uh, this is another uh, combined private and city-sponsored application, so I'll, I'll speak to that in a second here. Uh, we're looking at about 10.3 acres. Um, we're just southeast of the, the center that was developed with the target um, there by the south side um, uh, sports center. So uh, these, the parcel, the private applicant uh, included these parcels here. There's two parcels, this pork chop shaped one and then a little one from the west. that currently contains a single family house and some rural style outbuildings like a barn and uh, a shed. Um, the city council during the threshold process added in this northern parcel, which is in the same situation. Uh, it has a radio station building that I believe is uh, not occupied on a daily basis. It looks like it was at one time, but it's boarded up. And two radio antennas, two tall radio antennas. This site is owned and operated by iHeart Radio in Spokane. I have spoken to them, uh, and they don't have any issues with the, uh, with the proposal or being included. Uh, again, this is all in Southgate, uh, and it's it's right near the, the target, and it's surrounded, as you can see, on three sides by apartments. And I'll zoom out a little bit. Here, this white box in the northwest, that would be the target, and all of this that I'm highlighting is apartments. Um, these apartment buildings to the south were annexed to the city uh, just in 2017 and 2016. Um, and so the, uh, just to give you some background, those are, those are recent additions to the city, but all of this has been uh, in the city for a little while. Uh, the site itself, again, there's a single uh, home, is a rental home on the property with some outbuildings. Um, this dirt track you see going off to the right, that is, city, that is um, the extension of 53rd. It's an unofficial extension of 53rd. The uh, west half of that alignment is not yet a public right-of-way. And because of that, 
uh, as part of the SEPA for this project, the, uh, there was a mitigated negative declaration for it that said that, um, or I'm sorry, uh, anyway, that mitigated determination of non-significance, stating that at the time of development, the city would require that that, that northern half of the alignment be uh, dedicated as right away. So ultimately, 53rd is going to continue on to the east. This is, uh, this is a picture of the radio station. We're now in the northeast corner of the properties. And here you can see the radio station building um, and the access to the site. And just barely in this image, you can see one of the two radio towers. Uh, the proposal would be to take it from its current designation of R4 to 10, residential 4 to 10, and fold it into the residential 15 to 30 that is surrounding it. This purple area, this CC core that you can see, uh, that's the south, that's the center with the target in it. But it's important to note that the general commercial to the southwest is also designated as a center in the comprehensive plan. So this property, or these three properties, are immediately uh, adjacent to one center and very close to a second center. Uh, the zoning proposal, of course, would be to take it from residential single family to residential multifamily, again, to fold it in to all of it around there. Uh, we received no agency or neighborhood comments during the agency comment period. Uh, we did receive some comment cards from the neighborhood. Uh, the applicant, uh, as required, he, proposed, he presented to the neighborhood, I believe in February, and they mailed us some comment cards that they collected at that time. General statements of opposition. Those are in your uh, packets, in your staff reports. And then we did receive a letter, a late letter in opposition to, uh, to the proposal. And uh, according to the policies and the comp plan and the, and the decision criteria, staff's recommendation is that you approve this proposal. Uh, before we get into the applicant presentation, does Planning Commission have any questions? I have a quick question. Uh, would this area have been eligible for an overlay option because it's adjacent to the two CCs? Typically, our, our CC3 overlays are for neighborhood centers, um, but this being next to a, a, a uh, district, two district centers, it's probably more appropriate to, are you saying like it just being part of the center? Uh, yes. Similar to what we just did up north or is that a completely different animal? Well, that have to, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, if Tyrell is here, so having just done one, she might. It might be an academic question yeah. and irrelevant to, yeah, but just curious. Uh, yeah, this is Tyrell Black. I, I think uh, where the C3 overlays have been applied, they abut the CC1 or the CC2 zoning, and that is not the situation here. Thank you. Yeah, because that because that southern center is still unplanned, uh, you don't see that CC core zoning yet for that one. It is designated, but the planning process around it still has to happen. Ah, uh, that helps. So, uh, question for you, Chavin. Yes, sir. You said that that is. Part of the SEPA determination that the north side of the right of way would have to be dedicated to complete 53rd. But what's, I, I just want to confirm the south side of the right of way is already established. Is that true? Yeah, I'm trying. If you look here on the zoning map, and it's really small, I apologize. You can see this line here. That's actually the right of way, and it's only the southern half of the street that's currently a right of way. And that was, um, I believe that was done by the county or by us when these developed. So this would require that any future development include the northern half. Otherwise, we'd end up with a half a sliver of the street, and that never works well. So, and I assume I assume at that time the the cul-de-sac would be looked at as well. The cul-de-sac okay. itself is uh, what what I would call barely paved. <laughs> so it's it's clearly you know there's some work to do in there. High density dirt. Mm. <laughs> It's well packed. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, without any questions, any more questions, let's move into uh, public testimony. I don't see anyone signed up, so if anyone. Uh, actually, Mr. Hume, uh, the applicant, is here. Oh, yeah, let's do that first. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt <laughs> you, sir. Nope, I forgot. Thank you. No, I'm off text Hume. <laughs> anyway. Um, 
the discussion about that cul-de-sac, it is a temporary cul-de-sac, and the uh, right-of-way is dedicated on the south half. We have no problem with the MDNS requirement for full right-of-way improvement uh, uh, in conjunction with a building permit and development. You'll also notice in the configuration of those properties, those red line boundaries on the map, that this parcel does uh, have access out to um, the Palouse Highway. And that will help offset some of the uh, ingress and egress that would otherwise load up on 53rd out to Regal. Um, yeah, it's completely surrounded by apartments. And as you know from your path actions on this, it uh, made sense to bring the radio station in just so there wasn't a donut hole of single family in the middle of all this once it's done. So I don't believe the radio station has any intent uh, and any long-term plans of abandoning their services there. Um, that's something that's kind of hard to land uh, with radio towers, et cetera. And um, so they're, they'll just coexist alongside a, a, an apartment development that would occur on this property. There is a house on this and it is a rental. Uh, the tenant has been in there for, as he told me, uh, some eight years. So um, anyway, it's uh, that's how it's been used. We sent out uh, notices to approximately 1,300 tenants and landowners in the area, thanks to the formula that says occupants get notice. And that's all been done. So uh, the responses that you've had on this are, I would say, minimal. Uh, in light of what uh, we're proposing. Um, and I, of course, agree that it ought to be zoned uh, for multifamily use. Any, any questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Jim. Okay, now we go into public testimony. Uh, again, no one has signed up. Anyone on the, on the call would like to uh, Testify. This is Randy McLenn with the Central Neighborhood. Uh, go ahead, please. So uh, I'm not necessarily opposed to this uh, this change. Uh, I do have a question, though, um, for the applicant, perhaps uh, any city representation. What are the plans uh, for addressing infrastructure and access uh, to the uh, to this neighborhood, uh, especially going into the city center uh, and surrounding areas, we've already seen uh, a large increase of traffic as more and more of these uh, apartment developments go in. Um, that's putting a strain on Freya Avenue. Uh, that's getting a lot of spillover traffic uh, from Thor and Freya. And so I know that my neighborhood residents will be concerned with that increase of traffic. Again, I don't see that this is necessarily a bad change. Um, I just want to make sure on the record that the city is aware and is addressing these concerns as there is definitely a need for better connectivity north and south uh, to uh, meet that increasing vehicular demand. Thank you, Mr. President, if I could uh, answer the question. Yes, please. Okay. Um, so just in general, um, the, the traffic concerns with this application, we did uh, discuss with integrated capital management to make, to see if there would be any concerns from the additional load. Um, and they indicated to us that uh, there are, there is a series of, of traffic improvements in this area that have been identified as part of the traffic impact fee program. Um, and then, so any development that occurs were, for instance, this southern parcel to develop as apartments, uh, that development would then be charged an impact fee that then goes towards the funding and improvement, uh, funding and development of those improvements. Um, and so at that time, uh, ICM indicated that, it, that, that the additional load from this would likely uh, be addressed, you know, by those improvements that are already in the program. Um, but uh, we can we can forward your concerns, Randy, on to them as well, um, if you'd like. Very good. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, any other uh, testimony? Okay. Uh, hearing none, then let's uh, close the record on Z19503. Thank you, everyone. And then go ahead. Screw Terrific. Well, I don't want to get anybody excited, but this is the halfway part point. So <laughs> thank you so much for your attention so far. The, uh, the next application, Z19504 COMP, this is on 8th Avenue. It is in the West Hills neighborhood. Um, you can see the general location here with the star. Oh, uh, if my computer would remember, there we go. Uh, we're looking at about 2.2 acres in West Hills, just west of the intersection of Sunset and Government Way. Uh, it is two parcels with the same owner. They share ownership with the properties to the south, so that's this white hatched area. Um, and as you can see from the photo, this is this is mostly vacant. This site did uh, once contain uh, a, mo a mobile home park of sorts, um, but the mobile homes have been removed. There are some vehicles parked um, uh, and materials on the ground, but it's mostly vacant. There are, however, three multifamily residences on the site that are all owned and operated by the owner. So um, zooming out a little bit, you can kind of see it, uh, the railroad here kind of bifurcates the neighborhood in this area. All of these homes to the west are a significant level above this property. But you couldn't you couldn't necessarily see this property because of the steepness of the slope, the height of the trees, and the fact that the railroads in the way. Um, this intersection, of course, Government Way and Sunset. There's a mini center designated for this location, but not a whole lot of activity going on. Uh, several vacant buildings, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, I think that's it for the site. Uh, can I give you an idea from pictures? Unfortunately, January is the worst month to take site photographs. But you can see here that it is mostly vacant. There's still some like utility stubs, but not a whole lot on the site. Uh, and then these are the multifamily homes that are there. So the proposal is to take the current designation from residential four to 10. This purple color is that mini center that we talked about. Uh, it, the, the yellow is the residential four to 10. So it would be to take from four to 10 to bring it up to what is basically multifamily, residential 15 to 30 units per acre. 15 to 30 is our lower uh, end multifamily use. Um, the zoning would amend at the same time from RSF or residential single family to RMF, which is residential multifamily. Uh, this one, again, also uh, we're requesting the plan commission provide input and consideration of the policy, uh, that the, the location policy that's most pertinent to the application, and that is LU 1.4, which is higher density residential uses. Typically, higher density residential uses should be, you know, assigned near centers and corridors or in centers and corridors. This is not, you know, whether this is a center or not, this is next to a mini center is uh, somewhat nebulous, something that we would love to hear when you're deliberating. Um, and I've also provided LU 1.7, which is the policy around neighborhood mini centers, which calls for higher density residential use as a major component. Uh, during the agency neighborhood comments, the Spokane tribe uh, was concerned about some potential uh, that there might be some cultural resources on the site. They request that the for development, a site survey be conducted. Um, and then as far as public comments go, um, we, we did get a, a comment letter in during the comment period regarding mostly frontage and drainage and kind of access to the site concerns. That's all in your staff report. And again, because of the relationship with policy, comp plan policy wasn't real clear. Uh, the staff did not have a recommendation on this proposal. So before we uh, allow Mr. Hume to speak again, is there any questions for me from the Planning Commission? Oh, that's a quick one. Why, why wasn't this considered for expansion of neighborhood retail? Uh, expansion of neighborhood, uh, well, we can't expand neighborhood retail. Uh, per the policy, we, we are right. allowed to make neighborhood retail any larger than it is currently. Right, correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, nope, I there for a second. I, I remember now. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, Mr. Hume is here as the agent uh, for this application as well. If you'd like to speak. 
Thank you. And the, the site has um, carried on the vision that was there in uh, two previous applications that were short-circuited by the owner due to their own internal problems. Um, and that vision was to provide housing, affordable housing, for um, a ministry that they have, I'll call it, uh, where they've been using the, ho the motel for res uh, residential use uh, of, um, of addicts who have um, been able to uh, clean up their lives, I guess we'll say. And when the property uh, was uh, sold, uh, Empire Health, who under the name of Sunset Health LLC, acquired the property, but with the obligation of carrying on the vision for this uh, additional housing, uh, affordable housing. And I think you have a letter from Jeffrey Bell um, that uh, is the current uh, acting director of, of Empire Health. That uh, change of um, directorship is occurring this month. But uh, nonetheless, they are... Um, uh, certainly wanting this to be zoned so that they can uh, fulfill the obligations that they have under their uh, purchase. The, uh, it's flanked, as you saw in the staff report, by neighborhood retail, and therefore, among other things, provides uh, more intense use uh, in proximity of neighborhood retail services. We were uh, at one point, exploring some possibilities of vacating uh, Audubon Street, and in the aerial photo you're looking at, you see uh, just a rough dirt path that Kevin is pointing out there. Uh, that's Audubon. And then on the north, running east and west, is 7th Avenue. And then 8th Avenue was vacated or is vacated uh, on the parcel line between them. Uh, motel and the subject rezone. The uh, what we discovered through Eldon Brown was that there's a significant sewer line uh, in that rights of way of Audubon running north south to uh, the Sunset Highway, and therefore that road will not be vacated. Um, so uh, that, along with Seventh Avenue, will have improvements to it in conjunction with the uh, build out of the uh, Molda family. It's been presented uh, to the West Hills Community Neighborhood Council. Um, and they uh, are supportive of the proposal. And so with that in mind, we'd like to move forward and get this done. As uh, staff report uh, and my application point out, the uh, railroad, which you can see some railroad cars uh, strung out there, uh, they're up on a railroad berm, and uh, the Burlington Northern owns the triangle immediately west of the subject property. Uh, so it's really quite buffered and insulated from anything residential, which is quite nice uh, off to the north and, and to the west. Uh, there's a tunnel underneath that uh, railroad viaduct that um, uh, accesses that other neighborhood on, uh, I think it's on, well, you can see it uh, on 8th Avenue, or excuse me, 6th Avenue. Well, with that said, uh, it's a nice little uh, insulated pocket against the railroad berm and uh, fits in nicely with the surrounding neighborhood retail and should be approved. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we can move into public testimony on this. Uh, I didn't I don't recall the list, sorry. Uh, we have no one signed up, is that correct? 504? So anyone on online would like to testify? Okay. Hearing none, um, thank you. I think we can close uh, 
Z19504. All right. Okay, so the next application, Z19505 C0 or COMP. This one's on 10th Avenue in the Cliff Cannon neighborhood. This is an entirely private application. Uh, this is the subject parcel. It is a single parcel of 0.16 acres. Uh, we're about a block and a half or two blocks from the Huckleberry's uh, grocery store to give you an idea here. The, uh, the existing building, there's, a, there's an existing uh, older home and then an attached uh, expansion onto the west and then an older uh, garage in the back. All of these are attached. It's, it's, it's functionally a single structure. Zooming out a little bit, you see here's 10th. We're closer to Monroe. Um, and this is the Huckleberries and the uh, Ace Hardware, and there was a recent multifamily um, uh, use here developed, as well as a, a comp plan amendment last year, which cleaned up some of the zoning here. So you uh, folks are probably familiar with some of this. Um, it's entirely, you know, a residential kind of the whole block is residential, um, and the zoning I'll get into here in just a second. So it is, uh, again, a single structure on a single property. Here's the picture of the property. Again, January is a horrible day to take, or horrible month to take photographs, but there you go. Uh, here you can see this brown roofed uh, structure in the back is all the same structure. So it's this two story home, this block uh, construction addition, and this garage in the back with the awning. This is all the same property. So the proposal is to take it from its current designation, which is residential 4 to 10, and to add it into the residential 15 to 30 that exists catty corner across the intersection. Um, here you can see the neighborhood retail for Huckleberries. This is the residential 15 to 30 where that new development was. Um, and so this would just extend the residential 15 to 30 across the corner and to include only this property. The zoning would change commensurately from residential single family to residential multifamily. Uh, this one is going to rely on a policy 1.4, which is higher density residential uses. Again, the comp plan in general designates that for uh, centers and corridors designated on the map. This is not in a center or a corridor. Um, and it does allow you know, some infill, but typically in, within the boundaries of an existing uh, multifamily designation or where the land is predominantly higher density residential. Because of the, um, well, I'll keep going. Um, so during the agency neighborhood comment period, we did receive a comment from the Spokane tribe. Uh, this is a site with low probability of cultural resources. And then we received numerous public comments on this, uh, on this including a, a petition in opposition. Um, today you received an additional uh, letter from, the, from uh, Mr. Newson, who's the owner. Uh, speaking to some of the uh, statements in that as well, you should have received that in an email. Um, and then we do have a comment from Mr. Schramm in support that arrived uh, after the staff report was was published. So those those have been sent to you separately, and we'll get those on the website, like I said earlier in the presentation. Uh, the recommendation of staff is that it's uh, that it just does it does not appear to us that it meets the, the location criteria of policy LU 1.4, and therefore we do not recommend it for approval. Do the, uh, does the plan commission have any questions for me before we move on to the applicant? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to jump in here. Did, did we ever get more information on the changes in 2005 or six of, yes. of why? I see the map in here on, and thank you for that in section seven. Is that new or? Uh, the the current where? use. Uh, the map in uh, in staff report. I'm sorry, staff report. Staff report. Yep. Yeah. So that um, that was done by me in response to your you, the plan commissioner's questions at the workshop okay. about what the kind of buildings were around it. Um, regarding your first question on the 2006 land use change or a zoning rezone, that was a citywide effort. There is some discussion in the staff report about that. Um, there was a citywide effort to bring the zoning and the, and the land use more in line with. Um, the new comprehensive plan that was calling for density in centers and corridors, and also to conform to what was actually developed. So in other words, if we had neighborhoods like this one that were designated at the time for, uh, previously designated for very high densities, because this part of the neighborhood at one time in the 70s was designated for much higher density residential, but it developed differently at a lower density residential. 
the predominant development style here is, you know, one to three units, not tall, uh, you know, downtown style apartment buildings. It, at that, during that 2006 effort, that was brought back. And these, a lot of properties in the city were, were um, de- oh, well, the term is down zone. They were, their density was reduced at that time in order to more conform to the idea and the comp plan, the vision that density should be in centers. This is not a center. It developed at a lower density. Therefore, its zoning and, re- and land use was reduced at that time in density. Yeah, thank you for adding that section. It's really informative. It was, it was historic R3 similar to what's being proposed here? Well, I, uh, I have to I have to check. I don't want okay. to get it wrong because it changed so many times. Right. No, that's okay. That's a loaded question. So, okay, thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else with questions for the staff? Okay, then Mr. Hume again, is I, I presume? Yes, it's Mr. Hume again. Dwight? Todd, I have a question. Oh, okay. Please go ahead. Um, oh, I, I got so distracted by turning on my mic that I... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I remember now. Um, there was one letter that said um, that the property maintenance is a little lacking here. Has, um, does Kevin know whether there's ever been any kind of code complaint or any kind, kind of a complaint about that with the property? I do not know. I, have to, I would have to find out. Okay, thanks. Okay. Now, Mr. Hume, please. I think uh, to get this in the proper context, uh, it's unfortunate that we had to apply for multifamily zoning to get to where we want to go. But there's no zoning tools to use. Um, Historically, this site had a total of 16 uh, beds in it, if you will. Um, it operated as a nursing home from the mid fifties on at, at which time the, uh, side by side residences were merged together. It stayed that way until, um, I don't remember Kevin, what, what year it was that this uh, ceased to exist. We don't know, but suffice it to say that also in that uh, time frame, uh, the zoning for this neighborhood changed and eliminated the multifamily zoning. But as you saw, um, among other things in, in Kevin's uh, uh, page three of his staff report, figure one, you see a potpourri of uh, of other housing types, uh, duplexes and and multi-family uh, uh, tenants, and so this isn't that uncommon. But the reason for it was that uh, the current applicant and purchaser of the property knew that he was buying a non a no longer. Uh, had non-conforming rights to the nursing home that had been established on the property. He then uh, discovered that the only way he was going to be able to fully occupy the facility, as had been done for many, many years, from the 50s on up into the 80s, the uh, ability to do that now required to get to a multifamily zone in order to have senior housing. And he proposes uh, that that be the only use of the property and therefore is willing to uh, put the context of this zoning request and and hopefully approval into a development agreement. And I know you're not the party to do that. The council has to agree to that kind of thing. But in so doing, we eliminate the precedent for more multifamily zoning and also for the precedent of the use of the property for apartments. But even if that were the case, um, this 0.16 acres generates in their density range, contrary to Milt Rowland's letter, the density range is 15 to 30 per acre, not 30 residents on the site. So translate that into 0.16 acres and we're talking a range of two to four units if it was used for apartments. That's not what we want to do. We want to, and we're quite willing to 
have a development agreement that simply says that the facility will only be used, and by the way, uh, if we move forward with a development agreement, one of the other things that we have to do to accomplish our right to the use of the property is a subsequent application and approval of a conditional use permit. Um, all of those things are safeguards to allow us to go forward uh, and reoccupy the facility. We also understand, and I hope the neighborhood would uh, begin to understand that the reason that it has not been upgraded facility-wise is because we don't have the rights to use it yet. Um, there's uh, um, DSHS standards, uh, handicapped and ADA standards that have to be met in order to reoccupy the building. And we've determined that those things can be met but there's no sense going after all of that improvement until we have the zoning in place that allows us to go for the conditional use permit that allows us the nine, um, there's a 16 um, uh, beds to be occupied. Um, uh, Seth Knudsen is here uh, and will participate in this uh, to give you more understanding of that. He and his family have uh, operated the uh, Fairwood um, a retirement housing on the north side of Spokane. And uh, he's uh, sort of was born and raised in that uh, occupation and so certainly knows that this is something we can do. I think our role in this, ours being the planning commission, myself, and uh, hopefully the council, is to uh, not nip this in the bud for some fundamental reason that multifamily zoning shouldn't uh, be here but rather recognize that it's being used as a, as a zoning tool to enable us to fully occupy the building. And again, it's for senior housing, not for uh, standard conventional apartment use. With that, I will um, uh, turn it over to you for questions. Any questions? No questions for Mr. Hume? Okay, well, thank you again. Um, okay, then uh, let's move into public testimony. So we have uh, six that have signed up via the online form. We'll take, take those in order. I assume that's in order. And then, uh, and then entertain any other. Uh, so again, um, we have multiple letters that were submitted um, so if, if there's any uh, redundancy here, please please note that your written testimony is is, is as valid as your verbal. So please summarize if, if you're you also submit a letter. But uh, we'll, let's try three minutes and, and start with Mr. Milton uh, uh, Roland, please. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you. I can hear myself with a little reverb. Does everyone look at that? when they speak in the reverb. First of all, I want to um, thank um, staff for doing s uh, such a bang up job. And I don't just mean in, um, in, in the staff report and with which we almost entirely agree, but also in the way that staff has handled individuals calling in or even attorneys calling in and asking what's next. It's, it's really been, uh, been a privilege to work with, with staff on this. Um, because I have submitted two letters, one just today at about 11 in the morning, um, I, I won't touch on any of the things that are touched on there. I'd, I'd like to do something different for my last two minutes and 12 seconds. First, um, Mr. Hume is, is correct. I did make a mistake in the letter having to do with, with densities. And I'll own up to it, and, and hopefully he'll own up to the, the much more serious um, issue as to whether or not this property is located in a center and corridor. The initial uh, submittals seem to suggest that it was it was in a center and corridor, but as staff has pointed out, it clearly is not. The one message that was was turned in in favor of the proposal by, by a, a resident who doesn't appear to have anything to gain or lose by operation of, of the decision that you're going to make um, was a, a John Schramm letter of about um, August 31. And he makes 
um, five points that the numbers and we take issue with all of them, actually. Um, this first point is that this is uh, th this nursing home use would be uh, consistent with the neighborhood and add some vibrancy to it. Um, <laughs> there hasn't been a nursing home there in over 20 years, um, but we have residents and I have clients who've lived there longer than that. And the um, nursing home residents, you know, they're, they're there because they need care because they can't do all of their activities of daily living. They're not active participants in a neighborhood who would come to, you know, neighborhood group meetings or block parties or whatever. Um, what would be added would be traffic, um, noise, and um, and we fear a, a, a negative impact on property values. Uh, second, this property is, fits generally within the city of Spokane's own infill housing strategies by allowing the full utilization of a given property. That that really begs the question. It's certainly, any um, application for a, a use that's more dense than the one that previously um, or currently in use would quote unquote infill. But the city of Spokane said a lot when it amended its uh, comp plan and amended its zoning code in the 2005-06 area and left this as single family residential. What it said was, the buck stops here. What, what people have been doing, as, as staff pointed out, is something that we want to recognize in our codes but the buck stops here. We're not having um, great quote unquote infill uh, here, although frankly, I don't see it as infill at all. We have neighbors and my clients, did I say my name and everything? Milton Rowland, 1127 West 13th Avenue, Spokane. Sorry if I didn't. At any rate, we, my clients, Mr. and Mrs. Landry, uh, live in the 1100 block of South Jefferson and they've been there for 30 years. And uh, what <laughs> what they've seen is a deteriorating facility, um, grass uh, almost never cut. I, I don't know how it, it, it must be in January in the photograph. Because it shows Sorry to the, we're, we're at three minutes, but please complete your, your thought. Okay. Um, gosh, three minutes goes pretty it fast. Does, doesn't doesn't it? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, no, finish your thought, please. Again, um, I, I want to uh, thank you all once again for, um, for hearing us out and for uh, taking our concerns seriously. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, next would be uh, Ms. Judy Madden, please. Then are you on, are you on a phone? If you are and you can hear us, I think you have to hit star three. Is that correct, Jackie? I can. I I just did. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Yep. We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, um, everybody, for uh, your participation in this uh, conversation that we're having. I live on uh, the corner of 11th and Jefferson, so about a block away from Seth's property. And I know everybody can read the notes and the letters, and we're basically all saying the same thing that we're concerned about um, traffic, um, we're concerned about parking. Um, we're concerned about the, the maintenance that has not happened on that property. And I think that's something that was, was alluded to earlier. Seth's had that property, I don't know what, seven or eight years, and really has not done anything to it. He says he's going to get a bank loan for $100,000. And we all have old homes around here, and $100,000 barely gets you anything with an old house. And any time you dig into it, you know it's going to cost you more. Um, and, you know, I think he has good intentions. None of us are against seniors or assisted living centers. We just don't see how this is feasible um, with that building and all of the regulations that he's going to have to adhere to, um, et cetera, to even turn it into an assisted living and, and I know he says he's going to sign something saying that that's all he's going to use it for. But what do you think if, he, if the, the zoning change is made, anybody can buy that property and do anything they want with it, include, including turning it into um, a halfway house. You know, of course, people in the neighborhood also know that that's 
uh, a good thing to have, but, but nothing. That, there, there are enough in the neighborhood um, already. So um, I, that's, that's really all I have to say. I think it's probably going to cost more like a half a million to get that, that property up to code. And, I mean, it is just in terrible shape if anybody has gone by there and seen that it has. And there is no, there's no parking. There's a one parking. There's two parking spots. One is a tandem where you can get three cars in, but you know one car would have to move to get the other ones in. Um, so, and and people park on the street there. You know they don't have their own garages, so the parking would already be um, uh, a problem. You know, and, and ideally, you know, if that could be turned back into a single family home, I think we everybody in the neighborhood. Um, would would like that. I don't know if that's feasible, but, you know, lots of people are flipping homes around here and making good money and reselling them. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Madden. Uh, any questions? Um, okay. Thank you. With that, then let's move to Mr. Uh, I believe Josh Gabriel. Again, star three if you're on the phone. Oh, it looks like everyone's open. I don't see Mr. Gabriel on, on WebEx. Okay, we'll come back to you if you're on and having trouble communicating. Um, uh, Mr. Seth uh, Knudsen, please. Hello, uh, let me turn down my volume so the echo is bad is not so bad. Um, thank you, members of the Planning Commission, for your time. Um, I would like to start uh, by saying that uh, assisted living beds are very needed in Spokane and in the community in general. Um, my family and relatives operate eight different facilities in Spokane, um, so I do know that assisted living beds and senior care is um, quite in need. Um, uh, just to address a few other things, um, there have been no code complaints, um, to my knowledge, um, on the property. Um, the grass is cut professionally um, on a regular basis. Um, and I would completely disagree that senior citizens are not an active part of our community. I think that they are a viable part and they are a much needed part and they should not be pushed out of our community. Um, the concerns that I have seen um, fall into three different categories. The first is parking. Um, and I'd like to start with saying that at an occupancy level of 16 um, with, I would conform to the city's um, own guidelines of one to four ratio. Um, I have a three stacked parking stall, which um, only counts as one. And then there's room for three on, um, on street parking. Um, I could require my staff to park at the park and ride and ride up to a bus stop, which is um, at, on the end of the block. Um, currently, I am renting to six non-related adults, um, which is allowed in the single family zoning. Um, with those six residents, there are currently six um, cars that are parked um, that, that are owned by the occupants. Um, by definition, um, assisted living residents, very few of them drive. Um, at our facility here on the north side, um, two out of 85 residents actually drive. Um, so just about by definition, very few assisted living residents drive. So I would I either foresee traffic and parking actually decrease, um, and the pattern of parking would also decrease as the, the residents now are parked there large amounts of the time, and the majority of the parking would be visitors for brief, um, brief extents in the future. Um, the second concern is property values um, and improvements. Yeah. Um, I believe that with a large, in, and I don't disagree that it will take a large investment to bring this property up to code. Um, I am not naive to that fact, um, but I believe a improved and up to code 
assisted living will improve my property value and the property value of the homes around it, um, not actually take away from other homes' uh, values. And the Mr. third Ganesan, thing sorry, is, uh, sorry to interrupt, but can you please? And misunderstandings. Um, Mr. Ganesan. I have I seen the uh, petition that was lodged in opposition. Um, I have a supporting email that suggests and supports that um, those petitions were collected on a false pretense of it's going to be a halfway house. Um, I have never, never once said that I was going to make it a halfway house. I have no intention of that. Um, like Dwight uh, mentioned, I actually kind of grew up in a retirement home, and so that is what I do. That's what I know, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, Mr. Knutson, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm afraid we're, we're over time, but, but thank you oh. for, for your response, and, and we'll give Mr. Hume a, an opportunity as your re representative at, to, for rebuttal, if that's okay. Okay, sorry, I had my volume turned down if I didn't hear you earlier. No, no. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Can I ask a cool question? Yeah. Please. So, uh, Seth, I have a question for you. Uh, first, thanks for your testimony and thanks for take, taking care of um, people that require assisted living. So, are the current occupants, you said you're at a maximum of six occupancy, are those non assisted living people currently? And that you would then convert if you were if this were to occur, you would convert everything to assisted living. Um, yes, Greg, that is correct. At this time, um, I am just renting to six non-related adults um, just rooms without any care. But at the time of the, um, if it did appro get approved, then I would need to go through a conditional use permit with further public comment in order to um, um, utilize the, the whole facility as assisted living. Okay, thank you. Anyone else with questions for Mr. Knutson? Okay, thank you again for your time and application. Um, we're going to move on to Ms. Eileen Martin, please. Oh. Okay. Hello. You, oh, yes, please go ahead. Okay. My name is Eileen Martin. I live across the street from this building. And what I want to say is I've lived here since 2004 and I'm excited that the character of the neighborhood is changing next door to me on the east it was boarded up there was a rock band there were drug people and now it's single family owned and this is happening up and down the street i am meeting the neighbors for the first time in half a dozen years my property has not been robbed in the last five years and i see an improvement in in creating a neighborhood and a community and i want to know my neighbors and having a care facility across the street is not the neighborhood. And I, I believe given it as a single family home, we are safer, it's more stable with owner occupancy. I was with a group of neighbors and in a, I don't remember 2006 or seven or so, we worked together to have these all zoned single family residents. That zoning changed then. And we did that on purpose so that these older buildings would not be torn down and have apartments put up and so forth. We want to keep this. This is a historical neighborhood. Next door to that building on the east is a historical home. It's on the historical register. I believe Seth is sincere. We've had good conversations about him. I believe he's honest. But I think he's naive. The paint is chipping. The roof is bad on the west side of it the garage there's a hole in the wall that you can see through he has mowed the lawn but as far as i can see that's it he does have six people living in there i know three of them one of them definitely does not drive there are not six different cars on the street so i think that information is in error um 
I also watched the former owner go through two or three, at least two, people who purchased the property to run it as a care facility, and they failed, and it went back to the owner. So I think it takes an awful lot, and I don't think this building is it. It's very ugly. It's not any place I would put my mother. I think Seth just chose the wrong place, and when he purchased this house, he knew it was zoned single family. And now I talked to Dr. Uh, Mr. Hume as well. He said he just wants to return it back to what it was. We don't want it returned back to what it was. We work to get this to be single family to build our neighborhood. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, thank you, Ms. Martin. Any questions for Ms. Martin? Okay, we want to welcome testimony. We want to remind everyone to please refrain from, from what they received as personal attacks. Um, uh, Mr. Tom May is next, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hello? Hello? We can hear you, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I live at 1117 uh, West 9th and lived here since 1980, and the city's done a great job changing the zoning to single family. And there was a time when the house across the alley from me, which is right next to Ms. Martin's home, was going to be a halfway home, if that's the correct term, for people that need assistance. Then I checked in their city, and our neighborhood has the highest number of group care homes, and the current law of the city states that group care homes, multi-family homes, like the, even a assisted living for elders, is to be equal among neighborhoods. And so I think that's one thing to keep in mind, that our neighborhood has uh, a very high number of um, group care and uh, similar homes. So um, that was my basic, and I agree with the thing as the traffic increase and that um, single family has been growing here greatly over the last 40 years. So I would um, object to this proposal and would agree with the uh, suggestion that the request be denied. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. May. Um, I think we have a note here that Mr. Uh, Josh Gabriel was, was raising his hand. Are, are you still available? I assume you're on phone. I don't see you on WebEx. Excuse me, was that question directly no, no, on you? I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. May. No. Um, okay. I, I, I thank you for your testimony. Okay, thank you. No, I was uh, I was calling on Mr. Gabriel. We were coming back. We had signed up, and I think was trying to. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. That was Mr. May that I requested. Okay, anyone else? That's the end of our, our list. Anyone else would like to testify on this? Uh... Uh, yeah, I would. I'm not on the list. Nope. Please go ahead, Steph. Please state your name and and address. Uh, yeah, my name is Melinda Nates, and. Uh... I have worked with Seth on the neighborhood council and uh, know that if he says he's going to do something, that he is going to do it. <laughs> he, I don't think that, um, that we should be concerned with whether or not he is able to um, transform that property. Um, I, I am on the executive board of the neighborhood council. We presented this at the neighborhood council meeting. Uh, I'm not sure whether the minutes for that meeting ended up uh, in the record. Um, if it's uh, possible to still comment in writing, then I'll make sure that they do get there. Uh, we advertised it. There was um, people at the meeting, no one was in opposition, uh, and we see it as a, a good thing for that property be, to be developed, and I personally um, would, would 
think that the senior care facilities are highly needed. Uh, so I guess that's my comment. And thank you for that, Ms. Minx. Uh, just to answer your question, uh, so the plan commission will take action on this uh, probably in two weeks. We will close the record tonight, but uh, but we are an advisory uh, commission to the council as ultimate authority. So there again, there will be a public opportunity to address the council, testify to the council. If okay. that's helpful. Thank you. Plan commission president, if I could add one quick thing. Uh, yeah, please. Laura, uh, this is Kevin Freibot. If you, uh, if the neighborhood council wants the minutes to be part of the record, just make sure to get them to me, and then they'll be given to council, to city council, along with the, uh, with the record. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Ms. Ms. Meg? Okay, anyone else that we haven't recognized? Uh, I forget, I forget who we uh, missed on the list. Gabriel, okay. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, hearing none, then let's close the record on Z19505. Uh, so we are past our advertised time of 6 p.m. We still have one more 019 uh, application with three names that have indicated they would like to testify and then the two Z20s, right? Um, we have, we have one uh, Z20, which is a bike map, and I think we have some speakers for that. And then there's two Z20s uh, for uh, Inga Note from Integrated Capital Management. Okay, yeah, you're correct. I was misreading in that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We we closed the testimony on that, but we didn't give Mr. Hume a, a chance to a rebuttal on that. Oh, good, yeah. Mr. Hume, would you... Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, listening to the various uh, comments, parking, aesthetics, um, blending into the community, not just in terms of aesthetics, but uh, socially, et cetera. Uh, I never heard any complaints about the multifamily zone per se. Uh, it's more about the type of use and doubting that it can be basically cleaned up uh, by the proponent. Um, I will go back to what I said before, and uh, Mr. Rowlands asked me to own up to the centers and corridor issue. I never once mentioned that this was in the center and corridor. But we do, as I said in my uh, introductory remarks, we need this zone as a tool to get to a conditional use permit. And we strongly recommend a, a development agreement so that it doesn't get out of context as a precedent for more mobile family zoning. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, okay, so, so back to our discussion as a commission here and as staff uh, with Three left, and with and the first one with three, three signed up for testimony. And I'm I'm looking to see our, um, I see a Ra uh, Randy. I assume that's me, Randy McGlenn online. Uh, what's the commission's desire here that we, at least try to do one more. The first Z20. I think if we do one, we should do them all. And we should do who you have folks lined up to speak for. At least, I agree with that. I agree with that, and I'm uh, I'm here for going along uh, as far as possible and needed. Yeah, I'd be able to do that too. Okay. Uh, Inga, since you're the applicant, uh, how do you feel about that? Are you still able to hang on? Yeah, I don't think there's, is there anybody signed up to speak on mine though? I mean, I, you no can. One? You can push me to the 23rd if you want. Okay. I think that would be a good option if, if uh, unless anyone's opposed, since we're already coming back for deliberation on the all the Z19 and the first Z20. We should ask if there's anybody that would like to speak to it tonight. 
That would be another good way to do it. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Mueller. Uh, so in, in that, is, is anyone here from the public that would like to test, is here to testify on the two comp plans, Z20042 and Z20045, and I better let Kevin actually explain what those are. Yeah, so that, that would be the uh, amendments to the arterial street map and the text amendment about railroad crossings. Uh, and so, uh, and the bike one's still coming. That's the one we have people signed up for. So it's the, the ones you're asking about are arterial street map and railroad crossings. Okay. Since we do have uh, folks that want to testify to the bike amendment, I suggest we do that one. And then we could postpone the others since we don't have anybody signed up. Um, but Okay. Go ahead, finish that thought. And we could ask if there is anybody, once again, that would like to testify to okay. those last two. And if there's not, we could postpone those to the next and take public testimony at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's do that. Uh, so moving into Z20019, please. Um, oh, yes, I'm for sorry. That passes to, I'm, I'm sorry. So thank you, Kevin. <laughs> and all right, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still here, so, uh, <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it off to Colin because this yes. is an application. I recognize that transition. Okay, so Mr. Goodhurst, <laughs> please. <laughs> all right, yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, and good evening. I'm, as Kevin said, I'm here to provide information about proposed updates to the city's planned bicycle network. Um, I'll keep it brief. Uh, we have about a dozen proposed updates to the recommended facility types um, on the bike plan. And those are based on feedback from neighborhood councils, um, available road space and capacity, uh, safety, high activity destinations and community centers, and other, among other considerations. So for the next slide, um, you can see this is map TR5 that we'll be adjusting. And this is uh, the, primary, the bulk of, of these amendments, uh, although we do have two supportive text amendments, which I'll mention. In the category of bike lanes, we have four adjustments, uh, shifting those from shared lanes to bike lanes. Among those is a proposal for Boone, Atlantic, and Sharp, which would connect the North Bank up to the north part of the Gonzaga campus. Um, and this would involve shifting one travel lane in each direction uh, to a bike lane or a protected bike lane. And that's kind of a concept image just to get across the concept that the details would be decided in, in design. Uh, the others are for Altamont Street, connecting under the freeway up to Fifth Avenue, and for Flint Road, extending a bike lane through the airport loop, so connecting to the airport, and for Cowley through the medical district by St. Luke's. And next slide, in the category of neighborhood greenways, which are low-volume, low-speed local streets that are already good for walking and biking, but with additional safety improvements, uh, such as arterial, arterial crossings and traffic calming and wayfinding. Um, we have three proposals, two are upgrades from bike-friendly routes. Uh, so the first, 10th and 11th Avenue, came through the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council Traffic Calming Subcommittee, and it would connect Altamont Circle and the nearby Ben Burr Trail up through the Perry District, through Grant Park, and then up to the commercial area at 14th and Grand. Uh, for Cook Street, um, it would connect nearby neighborhoods uh, to the Shaw Middle School campus and the Northeast Community Center. Northeast Library that came through a walkability study of the area. And the last is an adjustment on 18th Avenue shifting and through comments from the Rockwood Neighborhood Council shifting this portion of that greenway, a planned greenway from 17th up to 18th to take advantage of recent improvements uh, such as a crossing improvement at 18th and Bernard and the existing Hawk signal at 18th and Manitou Park. And this would connect uh, destinations such as Catalva School, Manitou Park, and the Rockwood Market. Um, in the next category of shared use paths, um, these are primarily short sections upgrading um, connections on street to connect recent or upcoming uh, pathway projects. So an example would be connecting the Children of the Sun Trail along Garland Avenue over to the Shaw Middle School campus in Northeast Community Center, um, extending the Strong Road pathway that was installed this year over to Five Mile Road and extending the Centennial Trail north through the planned upriver park next to the Vista campus and connecting the south end of the Benbur Trail 
over to the existing pathway at the Calouse Highway and the new SGA Park and Ride. One more category is the bike-friendly routes. Um, we have one addition to this, which is Pittsburgh from Rich to Lyons through the Bemis and Whitman neighborhoods. And so this doesn't involve any changes except marking it up on the map as a good route to walk and bike. Um, and the reason for this addition is, is because it connects Rogers High School and takes advantage of this signal you sh shown here at Wellesley, um, which is kind of the rare uh, signal for a local street to get through an arterial like that. Um, there are two supportive text amendments. Um, the first is to define protected bike lanes and how they apply to the bike map. Um, it specifies that routes classified as future bike lanes may be considered for protected bike lane designs following additional assessment and review. And it also specifies that further network level planning would be required to identify a system of these types of routes. Um, the last text amendment is to remove outdated references to maps that have been superseded by map TR5, which we just looked at. And with that, those are all the bike plan changes, and I'm happy to be available for discussion. Thank you. Okay, well done. Thank you. Um, so since so she's applicants, I think we move right into public testimony, correct? Okay. So with that, we have uh, three that have signed up on the online phone. Uh, can I ask a question? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. So, Colin, in one of the public comments uh, from Eileen Hyatt, she talked about 17th versus 18th and that 17th had a much better grade for bicycling. I mean, do you have any comments or thoughts about that? I think 17th, what is an existing bicycle lane? Is that right? Or a bicycle route? Yeah, 17th is identified as a planned uh, neighborhood greenway currently. Um, and it goes all the way, that route goes all the way down to Cedar. Um, and so this takes a section of that route and starting at Stevens by, by Cataldo and moves that over one block. And so, you know, checking out this route back and forth, uh, meeting out there on the street and then based on feedback from the Rockwood Neighborhood Council um, and their traffic calming applications, they're looking at 18th. And so they were looking at ways to, you know, mesh their traffic calming application with, with the bike plan. Um, and based on that analysis, um, there is a slightly steeper grade towards the end by Upper Terrace, um, but not significantly different. And the benefits of, of using that, that new RFB at Bernard by Cataldo and the existing Hawk signal, um, they aren't likely going to put in another crossing improvement one block away at 17th, really want to take advantage of those and, and connect those destinations. So um, definitely acknowledge her point, and it's a good one, um, but feel like the other benefits um, and public comment um, point towards 18th. So are there any issues with that cut through through the park itself? Because that is, it's right there by the pond. It kind of does jump back and forth. I mean, is that I don't know the level of volume you're talking about as far as bicycling. Right, yeah, that will take some careful design and, and coordination with parks. That's probably the trickiest section right there. Um, the advantage is that there's a lot of um, public land to work with um, but um, and, and limited traffic, but it is tricky because it's essentially a parking lot through there. It's a good point. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions for, for Colin? Thank you. Okay, public testimony. Uh, we, we have uh, Ms. Jess, Jessica Engelman, please, if, if you're still with us. If not, then Mr. Randy McGlenn and then Ms. Linda Carroll. Okay, let's move on to Mr. McGlenn and we'll come back to Ms. Engelman if, if needed. Thank you, sir. This is Randy McGlynn with the East Central Neighborhood. I wanted to comment regarding uh, this uh, plan amendment. Uh, in particular, I have some concerns about modification number 10 regarding Boone Avenue. Uh, as you may be aware, there is a sportsplex that is being constructed that is going to impact traffic along Boone Avenue and the surrounding arterials. And 
considering this design, reducing the number of lanes on Boone Avenue when this area sees significant traffic during events uh, I think, in my opinion, is counterproductive to what is being considered for uh, being amended along this arterial. Uh, I'm on the Pedestrian Tra Traffic and Transportation Committee, and uh, I can tell you that our conversations are dominated about bicycles, pedestrians, and mass transit. We very rarely talk about the impact to vehicular traffic. and uh, I believe that if we put these bike lanes in along Boone Avenue, we are instead of having a multimodal solution that helps complement uh, the different modes of transportation, we're actually putting them in competition with each other. And I don't believe that that's going to work to the benefit of uh, the new facilities that are going in. People are, are going to be discouraged to visit these locations if it's too much of a hassle to get in and out of those facilities. As as a person who has attended uh, hockey games and uh, the former shock events, I know that it is a great ordeal trying to leave those facilities after those events are over. And it takes an enormous amount of time for traffic to eventually work its way out. Uh, seeing how drivers get frustrated uh, at the traffic jams and being able to get out of the facility in a timely manner uh, reducing the number of lanes along Boone Avenue is going to flare those drivers uh, uh, even more. And I am concerned that people are going to uh, get hurt when there is uh, this uh, pretext of, of a safer pedestrian and bicycle area. I believe that um, uh, this could be counterproductive for that. I would instead, and I know that it's probably not going to be in the place of uh, uh, the plan commission to recommend changes. However, if it is, I recommend that they, they go back and amend this and consider uh, a greenway uh, or an alternate bike route that complements the arterial that can have connections into those facilities rather than putting them along that arterial, which would take up those, those lanes and resources for the traffic to get through. This, you know, I, and I hear a lot of uh, talk about equity in, in transportation, and I completely understand, and I would like the Planning Commission to know that uh, I'm very supportive of our green room projects, and I definitely want uh, to see more development of these areas of modes of transportation. But I think that there needs to be synergy between these different modes, and that all of our methods of transportation will work better when they're better connected in ways that actually work cohesively rather than in competition with each other for these resources. I also- Great, Mr. Uh, McGlynn, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm probably, probably letting this go pretty long. Okay, but no problem, good. I'll, I'll yeah. stop there, thank you. No, thank you so much for your, your testimony. Okay, and then um, any questions for Mr. McGlynn, by the way? I guess I have a question, this I guess goes back to Colin, as far as responding to that, is the proposed change, if you're adding bike lanes, are you narrowing the existing lanes or, you know, in keeping two lanes each direction on Boone, or are you actually eliminating one of the lanes on Boone? Uh, yeah, it's currently two lanes in each direction, and we convert to one lane in each direction for vehicle traffic and convert the outside lanes to bike lanes or protect the bike lanes. Um, and so, you know, we have traffic volume information, um, and we have integrated capital management on the line too. Um, if we want to get into the details, Bob, I have a question for Randy. Randy, how much uh, coordination have you done on the Boone project with the North Bank Planning Group? Unfortunately, I learned about this project after it was already through most of its commenting period. And I think that that's a, a shared frustration, not only with myself, but with other members of our communities. They often do not hear about these projects until it's too late. And so uh, many of the people that are involved in these projects uh, have a great amount of ear time, if you will, with a number of the departments within the city, within our, our planning committees. I am probably the only person 
of one or even a very few that actually represent the concerns of vehicular traffic within our city and the concerns of many of our residents of being able to move through and about the city. And so, uh, again, did not get to your answer or to your question. I didn't get a chance to be uh, part of that conversation, but uh, I definitely want to make sure that we're improving uh, our communication so that we have more balanced uh, conversation about all modes of transportation that affect these projects. Okay, anyone else? Uh, questions for Mr. McGuinn? Otherwise, we'll move on. Um, Ms. Linda Carroll, available. Um, I'm here. Great, thank you. Please go ahead. Um, my name's Linda Carroll, and I live at 215 West Waverly Place. And I actually have quite the opposite perspective from the one that was represented by the person preceding me. I use my, my bicycle as my only wheeled form of transportation, and my uh, triangle of frequency is Corbin Park, Gonzaga University campus, and downtown. So I use this area all the time. I very much support uh, converting those two lanes to protected uh, to bicycle lanes for a couple of reasons. Number one, we've already lost Cataldo. Cataldo, which was the main, it was a wonderful access route from the Gonzaga campus downtown, uh, is now closed because of the sports complex. And that's one of the, the big reasons uh, for looking at um, uh, uh, increasing um, uh, the availability to bicycles of the Boone uh, Atlantic Sharp Corridor that, in, in a sense, kind of replaces Cataldo. Um, I use it all the time. Uh, it is true that when there are events there, there is, uh, you know, obviously additional traffic. But on a day-to-day -day basis, there actually isn't an awful lot of traffic in that area. There's an official bike uh, path that runs uh, north-south on Howard that crosses Boone. And I can tell you from that that currently it's pretty dangerous because there's a lot of uh, speeding along Boone. And I think that changing uh, Boone from two lanes each way car to uh, making two of those lanes for bikes would help the, the danger factor a lot because the west end of Boone, uh, there have been a lot of accidents and uh, because of the speeding on Boone, and I think that changing it um, to promote more bike uh, travel there would, would help with that particular problem. So um, that's kind of about all I had to say. Thanks. Thank you for that. Any questions, Mr. Okay. Uh, anyone else that would like to testify on this matter? Oh, if, if I can make just one real short um, testimony. I'm in the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council. And sure, please. Can they, you state your full name, though? Oh, Carol Comsick. Thank you. I, I just like to say I love the um, greenway that's going to be in our neighborhood. So we're real excited to see it. Which greenway is that again? Oh, the one, the one Kamala talked about on 10th and 7th, the one that's our traffic. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention um, that there is a traffic analysis memo for Boone that we'll be posting on the website. So it'll be available. Um, and so that's just one more piece of information that people can reference. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, anyone else on the master plan? Okay, uh, Colin, anything you'd like to say based on those comments? This would be the opportunity for rebuttal. Um, no, those are great comments. Um, I think that brought to light you know, concerns on both sides that we need to be aware of. Um, and you know, we've been taking this to the process and, and that's the real goal right now is that we wanna bring it to people at this stage and get these types of comments at this stage uh, before it's funded and designed. Um, and Boone in particular, um, a lot of those details with how it impacts traffic volumes, particularly events, would, would be worked out in the design phase. So thanks thanks for your time. Okay. Thank you, Commission President, if I could say something real quick. Yes, please. Just in a, as a, as a follow-up to Colin's comment as well, just 
something for everyone uh, that's it's, it's obvious in the staff reports, but not always in the presentations, is that um, map amendments like this to the bicycle master plan, and, and the same is true of the, a lot of the amendments to things like the arterial plan, these are plans for the future. So um, I just we just want to make it really clear to everybody that nobody's going to be able to bike lane tomorrow because the map changed today. And so um, it is good to get these these kind of comments because this is the beginning of that process, not the end of that process. So that's all. So I, I guess a follow up to that, Kevin, and since I see Inga's full on, she can be a sacrificial lamb here. Um, if this passes with the with the avenue, then in the future, if there is an engineering design and a review of it, is there, would it take a look at the existing traffic volumes at that point in time to say, okay, this is something we do, this is something we don't do, or we need to find an alternative? Inga, do you want to speak to that or should I take a shot? Um, why don't you take a shot and I'll add on to it. Okay. Uh, the, the the gut shot is that, or the you know the from my gut, I would say, you know, whenever whenever we start the design process, we look at the conditions then, not the conditions you know five years or four years before when the when that plan was thought up. I mean, obviously, we want to update the information. So. Okay. Um, I guess I, I will just add that when we make the map amendments, we try to consider how this facility would fit within the right of way and currently it does not fit unless you take the bike lane take the travel lanes away and so that's why i did prepare um a several page memo where we we did talk with the public facilities district about how it would impact them and you know it, it, it is i think one of the people who called in said that you know the traffic volumes are pretty low on a day-to-day -day basis and they are but the time that I have concerns with that I expressed in the memo is during is events. And just having driven by Boone Avenue when people are arriving for events at the arena, I've seen how, you know, the the curb lane can stack up with traffic for, you know, a couple of blocks. And if you only have one lane for people to stack in, then, you know, you have gridlock for a little while. So, um, you know, if, if you want to take a look at the memo um, the, before the, the continuation of the hearing in the next couple of weeks, you know, that'll give you a little bit of the information that, that we were able to get. I think that would be useful. And then uh, another question uh, would be, I guess, is PFD on the distribution list for comment? They are? Okay. And they, yeah. they never responded at all to this. I'd like um, to make one more comment <clears throat> with regard to Boone. I was on the North Bank Planning Committee uh, of two or three years ago, and we identified Boone as the only major cross-town east to west uh, vehicle. And, you know, we need to go back and look at some of those old North Bank Plan Commission reports. And regarding the question about meeting with the PFD, uh, we did meet with the PFD and, and got their comments, and it's it's in the, the record and the staff report. Okay. Okay, making sure we don't get into deliberation. Um, are there any other questions for any staff at this point? I think we're on. Maybe I, my quick one, following up on Michael comments and question is um, the timing of this is this helpful first of all is it aligned with the North Bank effort and is it helpful for when we can pick up the North Bank planning to move forward with this so one reason this came up at this stage is um, the North Bank plan identified a connection through the sports flex area as a uh, walking bicycle connection but with the vacation of Cataldo Right. Um, that is no longer part of the project. So Boone was uh, seen as the alternative, and that's why I'm um, at that time. Council passed a resolution stating that Boone is uh, Boone as the option if Talos vacated. Um, and so that transpired um, 
after most of the North Bank plan involvement sessions. That's helpful to remember that. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on uh, on this? Okay. So let's formally close the record, and then uh, um, we've already we've already done kind of a rebuttal here. So um, okay, with that, if we want to move into the last two comp plan amendments. Let's do a little bit of polling here. First, the public. Is there anyone from the public that would testify on the, the last two comprehensive plans, which are the arterial network map and the railroad crossing safety text amendment? Okay, speak up if, if I'm not waiting long enough. Uh, okay, staff, what are your thoughts? I would suggest Inga. that we postpone the the last two until and leave the record open for those two until the next meeting and close the hearing um, for all the other compliment amendments we've heard so far. Okay, that, that seems pretty reasonable. Any commissioners opposed in support? I would support that. Okay. I, would support, I would support it. All right. I would go along with it. All right, we'll round up from there. Me too. <laughs> okay, so what we're saying is that on September 23rd, I believe, we will have another hearing, which will be a continuation of, of, of all hearings, uh, the Z19s and the first Z20 in the bike plan, and then we will take public testimony on September 23rd for Z20042, Z20045, and then we will deliberate on all. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Well done, everyone. That was very productive. Thank you. Everyone sounds very eager to be done. <laughs> <laughs> I said productive. Productive. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> imagine why. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We're adjourned. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. All. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.